All right, this lecture is on the knee joint. So uh, even though we just call it the knee joint, it actually has two joints that we need to be aware of. So first we have the tibiofemoral joint, which is where your tibia and femur are, of course, and then the patellofemoral joint between the patella and the femur. So the knee joint itself is actually made up of two joint or uh, two joints. As always, we need to make sure we understand osteology. So the structure of the bone and the supportive structures with the ligaments so that we can understand uh, how we can start to have impairments. So let's take a quick look over here at the knee. Um, opened up a little bit. So minus the capsule, because it's a synovial joint, the knee, uh, this is it. Uh, the knee is a pretty simple joint, um, but a lot of things can happen. And I actually find it very fascinating. So we have our ACL ligament here. Throw that guy in. We have our LCL, lateral collateral ligament over here. We have our PCL in the back, of course. And then, ran out of colors, we got our MCL over here on the medial side. And then we should be able to do our lateral and medial meniscus, and that's it. So a big part of what you need to try to really understand for this term so that we can treat patients next term is the mechanisms of injury and how different forces are going to stress different parts of the knee. So let's look here at a valgus producing force. So a valgus producing force is going to make the knee look like it's not kneed and depending on the amount of force, very not kneed. So with a valgus producing force, we are going to really stress the MCL. It's gonna open up that medial side. So that MCL, that medial collateral ligament is gonna be stressed. Now it may tear, doesn't mean it's going to, but over too much force is going to tear it. That's the stress portion. The compressed portion is gonna be the lateral meniscus. Now let's say someone wasn't injured. Over time, obviously this outside is going to wear out. And then this ligament is going to get lax on the on the medial side. So we should be able to do the same thing with a varus force. Varus force, and this is much more rare in terms of a mechanism of injury. Somebody just might have genu uh, varus at the knee, and we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. But when a varus force is added, or if it's already there, then it's going to stress the LCL, and then put compressive force on the medial meniscus. So we need to be able to do that here. Let's pull this picture up so you can kind of see that. And if we go back to the valgus producing force, a lot of times, if you think about a football hit to the side of a player's knee, not only are they going to tear the MCL, oftentimes the ACL is torn. And because of where the MCL actually is, it connects to the meniscus, medial meniscus. And you can get an injury to all three. And that's called the unhappy or terrible triad. That doesn't mean you also couldn't tear the PCL on the back, very possible. Or it could be so bad, you could even tear the LCL and have complete rupture of the knee joint. But a very common injury is that unhappy or terrible triad. So what is that valgus varus I'm talking about here? Well, generally the knee is in a slight bit of valgus, which means whenever there's valgus for any of these joints, it means the distal end, so down here the tibia, is slightly lateral or is lateral. It could be severely lateral. So if the tibia was more lateral in this situation, we would have the knee actually going in more and that's where we get that knock knee look. Normally, what we would like to see is about a 170 degree arc. So not fully straight. If it's fully straight, then it's not really absorbing, for, um, absorbing forces correctly. It's they're too pinpointed on the knee joint and that can wear it out even more. So being perfectly straight is not good either. And I don't even know if anyone is that way, to be completely honest with you. So the valgus is excessive tibia moving lateral or the femur moving medial. So here is your valgus or also called valgum. And genu is knee. So if it says genu, because there's going to be coxa valgum, so there's going to be a different joints. are going to have different types of names before the valgus or valgum. So 
make sure you have that down. And then genuverum or genuverus is gonna be over here on the right side. That's your bow legged. And you need to know what forces are compressed or what structures are compressed and overstressed with those deviations. All right, and even here, I got you a couple, couple little extra degree numbers to look at. You got your less than 170 degrees is your valgus, greater than 180 is your varus. Don't have to necessarily have those memorized, um, but you should have a general concept of where that is. So if you see something like that in an exam, you know what it's talking about. And we're gonna add in, you see here on the notes, this pronation component. We're gonna add that into the Q angle here in a little bit. I'm gonna talk about that. So let's go back to those structures, those support structures I was talking about. So I talked about the forces that can injure them. So with the ACL, the ACL, we need to know what the ligament is resisting. A ligament can't stop compressive forces, it stops stretching or pulling. So it resists anterior translation of the tibia on the femur. So we have some special tests for that. The anterior drawer is the most used. Lockman's and pivot and shift. So if you see those on the exam, you should know that a positive one of these means ACL injury, possibly. We have the PCL. It's going to resist posterior translation of the tibia. This one usually is injured with what's called a dashboard injury or falling directly down on the knee. So if you fell right down on your knee and actually hit the tibia, the tibial tuberosity, you would jam that tibia posteriorly and that would then pull on and stretch and tear the PCL. Just like a dashboard, you're sitting in the car and there's a car wreck, someone gets slammed forward, their tibia hits the dashboard, po pushing it posterior, thus tearing their PCL. This also happens, like I said, to players if they fall directly on their knee. We already talked about the MCL and LCL. And there's little, it's called literally a valgus or varus stress test to test those guys. So we can look at those in lab real quick. Um, when doing the anterior drawer, for example, for the ACL, it's important that we check to make sure it's not a positive PCL tear first. And I can show you why in the lab. And then just a couple other special tests for your medial and lateral meniscus, the Apley's and McMurray's tests are important for that. And a really important part of the meniscus is not only for shock absorption, but it helps deepen the socket on top of the tibial plateau for the femoral condyles to be in there. So it makes it deeper. And you'll see with the hip how that structure even makes it a more stable joint because of the deepness of the socket with the labrum. And then we'll compare that to the shoulder. A couple of uh, basic arthrokinematics. We've talked about these a lot already at the knee, but we need to add in the patella. With extension, it's going to be a superior glide. I mean, if you squeeze your quads, you can easily feel that patella move uh, superior, and when it flexes, it clearly moves posterior or inferior in this case, not posterior, sorry, inferior. And then you should be able to do this, tibial femoral joint, open chain knee extension. Which bone is moving? Tibia is moving. Which rule? It's concave on convex, which means everything is moving the same. So if it's an anterior roll, it has to be an anterior glide. You better be able to do that to all those, um, think through that and get them done in 80 seconds. <clears throat> now the Q angle. All right, so this is the pull of the quads on the patella and this causes a lot of your patella femoral issues. So let's take a look at the Q angle here. So because of that valgus, there's a little bit of an angle that occurs, which is fine. So the quads, the way they pull, because the way they insert up on the pelvis, that's gonna cause a little bit of an angle, which is fine. That's your Q angle. Now, if we increase the valgus, oops, lost the draw. If we increase the valgus, so the knee goes over this way, that's going to increase the Q angle. So how does valgus increase? Well, there's a couple ways that the valgus could increase. So the valgus could increase, let's go here, let's redraw this. So an increase in valgus will increase Q angle. So how does the valgus increase? Well, we could have over pronation 
of the foot and ankle. We talked about that in our last chapter. Something that's a little new, we'll talk about more at the hip, but a decrease in hip abduction strength, which is gonna cause um, plenty of issues with the pelvis. We'll talk definitely more about when we get to the hip itself. So both of those can cause an increase in valgus and increase in your Q angle. So things that need to be done to help with that, because an increased Q angle is gonna to start to cause more lateral tracking of the patella, which we want to prevent. We want to prevent this. So I got something for you that's like always the right answer. We need to strengthen the VMO or the vastus medialis oblique. When you uh, tighten those quads in, um, and really contract those quads, that nice little, if you have a teardrop on that medial side of your leg right there, that's your VMO. That is crucial for helping the patella track medially. So weakness of the VMO, which is a lot of times caused by pain of the patellofemoral joint, as soon as they start having any, well, really any knee pain, then that starts to occur. So the knee pain could come from the medial meniscus. That pain starts to make the VMO shut down. Now the patella is going to start to track more lateral. Now you're going to have pain in the knee and with the patella. So we need to strengthen that VMO. That is always a good answer. We'll just talk about how next term, um, how it's most appropriate to try to strengthen depending on where someone is in the healing progression after a surgery or if they just have an injury, the best way to do that. The next thing to do is to work that IT band running down that side and any of these structures on the lateral side. So we need to, oh, it's too big, stretch the lateral side of the knee and strengthen that VMO. Now, People get in a debate about whether or not you can stretch the IT band, stretch, reduce adhesions, whatever you want to call it, it's going to need work. So I love being able to make, start making these connections. And as you're studying, this is really something you should be doing. You should be able to write one word down, valgus, and you should just be able to start making arrows and connections all over the place. And then here in the notes too, I got a little bit more about that just to remind you. So if you want to pause it and see my notes a little, little nicer here with this, whoops, not supposed to be the black one. Little nicer here. And I want to talk about the screw hole mechanism real quick. So the knee is a condyloid joint. So it has two degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom. So you have your flexion extension, but also rotation to lock that knee. So when it's open chain knee lock, the tibia is going to externally rotate on the femur. When it's closed chain, the femur is going to internally rotate on the tibia. And if you just take your camera and do a little slow-mo, you can see that um, generally pretty easy. So of course, our closed pack position is going to be fully extended. <laughs> that knee's locked, so full extension for sure. And then the book, uh, academically, it says about 25 degrees of flexion is going to be the open packed position. Now the second line down here is actually for the patella. So full extension is the open packed position for the patella. So if you're doing patella mobs, they should be in full extension. And the closed pack position will be anything that's over 20 degrees of flexion. Think about as you're squatting down, what's that gonna do to the, the kneecap? It's gonna start compressing it into the femur. So that's why body mechanics are so important, especially when someone has patellar issues. Now we've talked about valgus and varus. We need to talk about one more deviation, and that is genuricurvatum or hyperextension of the knee. Um, this can be due to, or well, this will definitely decrease stability at the knee. It could cause a leg length discrepancy, and it will increase the laxity of the posterior capsule of the knee. What causes this? Well, you could already have laxity of the posterior capsule. Your hamstrings could be weak because they don't get your knee out of hyperextension. But the best answer is going to be weak quads. So there is a gait deviation called a weak quad gait, which leads to hyperextension. The reason you hyperextend when your quad is weak is because the patient, as soon as they put their heel down for heel strike, they slam their knee back into hyperextension so their quads don't have to work eccentrically. 
and we can look at that more in lab two and we'll talk about it a lot more in um, our lecture on gait abnormalities. Two major muscles for the knee or two major muscle groups we should be looking at here, rectus femoris, I bring that up because it can be passively insufficient because it's gonna cross the hip and the knee joint itself. There is a test for this, it's called a Eli's test. A positive Eli's test means the rectus femoris is tight and the PT wants you to stretch it. For the hamstrings, there's gonna be two tests. There's gonna be the 90-90, and I'll show you how to do these in lab, and the straight leg raise test to see if the PT wants to um, have them stretch. And this is a way you can monitor muscle length so you can see if there's been any improvements. Tight muscles obviously cause a lot of deviations. One quick one we'll talk about, we'll talk a lot more about all this at the pelvis, but just to go ahead and bring this up now, tight hamstrings, are not going to connect to the coccyx here as in this picture. They connect to ischial tuberosity, but what they're going to do is it's going to posteriorly tilt that pelvis back, and then that's going to decrease the lordosis in your low back, which reduces the, um, the shock absorbing properties and starts to cause back pain simply because you have tight hamstrings. So that's another reason we need to understand passive insufficiency of muscles and how they can get tight. That's a quick rundown on this here, so make sure to look at your PowerPoints and read through the chapter to supplement the information that I've given you. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments or email me, um, whatever way is best for you to communicate.